Here are the lungs, look how they are working. Getting oxygen inside the body and throwing carbon dioxide out. Now, what if the lungs are unable to conduct this own process of in and out? Yes, they fails. So it's called respiratory failure. Respiratory failure is a condition in which the lungs fail to conduct their very own process of gas exchange. So what causes respiratory failure in the first place and how do we diagnose it? Let's get started. First, let's look at a case scenario where a 37 female with a history of fever and cold cough for seven days presented with complaints of breathlessness. When she arrived in the ER her saturation was 82% with a respiratory rate of 26 to 28. On auscultation, bilateral crepitus and chest x-ray review haziness in bilateral lower lobe with dense consideration, a typical picture of pneumonitis. An arterial blood gas is performed. Her pH was normal, but PO2 values or partial pressure of oxygen was 52 with normal PaCO2 levels. This overall picture suggests hypoxia without significant acid-base changes in arterial blood gas. So hypoxia is a condition in which the amount of oxygen in the blood falls below normal. Then, what is normal? In arterial blood gas the normal level of PaO2 is between 70 to 110 on room air or without any oxygen support. In this case, it's 52, so it's hypoxia. This kind of respiratory failure is called hypoxic respiratory failure or type 1 respiratory failure. Now what causes this kind of respiratory failure and how to manage it in ICU settings? As we have discussed, hypoxia is low oxygen concentration in blood. Intrapulmonary shunting of blood produced by airspace filling or collapse, pulmonary edema lead to left ventricular failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome, or intracardiac shunting of blood from the right to left sided circulation causes it. Acute respiratory distress syndrome is one of the major cause of AHRF or type 1 respiratory failure. ARDS is graded according to severity into three categories into mild, moderate, and severe ARDS. This classification is called Berlin definition of ARDS. Whatever, but any direct or indirect injury to lungs causes acute respiratory distress syndrome. So what exactly happens in acute respiratory distress syndrome or what its pathophysiology, let's analyze it first. Now, pay close attention. Any kind of lung injury, either direct or indirect cause lungs inflammation. The inflammation is of two types, either pulmonary or systemic inflammation. This is what happens in acute respiratory distress syndrome, there is pulmonary or systemic inflammation, which leads to release of cytokines and other pro-inflammatory cells. Cytokines are messengers, they serve the immune system by regulating the body's response to disease and infection, as well as mediate normal cellular processes in your body. Whereas pro-inflammatory cells, some cytokines act to make disease worse which are called pro-inflammatory, whereas others serve to reduce inflammation and promote healing or anti-inflammatory. These all cytokines activate alveolar macrophages and recruit neutrophils to the lungs, which in turn release leukotrienes, oxidants, platelet activating factor, and proteases. Don't worry, you don't have to remember all of them, just try to understand the concept. These substances damage capillary endothelium and alveolar epithelium, disrupting the barriers between capillaries and air spaces. Now, these air spaces are filled with fluids, proteins, cellular debris which leads to edema and ultimately cause disruption of surfactant, airspace collapse, ventilation perfusion mismatch, shunting, and pulmonary hypertension. Now, as we know, the lung injury could be either direct or indirect. Common causes of direct lung injury are acid aspiration and pneumonia. Whereas, causes of indirect lung injury are shock and trauma like a prolonged hypovolemic shock. There is one more term we need to understand which is called refractory hypoxemia. There is no clear definition of refractory hypoxemia, however it is often used when arterial oxygenation is deficient despite optimal levels of inspired oxygen. Means even when the delivery of oxygen is adequate, there will be low levels of PaO2 in arterial blood gas, common in patients with COPD or asthma. One reason for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure in these patients. As we have discussed, acute respiratory distress syndrome is graded in three categories by Berlin, which is also called the Berlin definition of ARDS. 
We have discussed the grading of ARDS and formula to calculate the P by F ration in this video above, PaO2 or partial pressure of oxygen in blood, in our ABG analysis series, check out out to learn, for now we will focus on AHRF or acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So, how the patient with AHRF present in ER, or let's look at the signs and symptoms. Hypoxemia causes symptoms such as dyspnea, restlessness, and anxiety, see also oxygen desaturation. Symptoms include confusion or altered consciousness, cyanosis, tachypnea, tachycardia, and diaphoresis. Cardiac arrhythmia and coma are two outcomes that could occur. Crackles are caused by the inspiratory opening of closed airways, which can be heard during chest auscultation. The crackles are usually diffuse, but they might be louder near the lung bases, especially in the left lower lobe. High amounts of positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP, or right ventricular failure to diagnose jugular venous HRF, distension. You need to do two investigations. First, get a chest X-ray and second is arterial blood gas. Pulse oximetry is mainly used to detect hypoxemia. While waiting for test results, patients with low oxygen saturation should have a chest X-ray and ABGs and be treated with supplemental oxygen. We're looking for pathology on X-ray, which could include alveolar flooding, rather than an intracardiac shunt, is the origin of an apparent alveolar infiltration on chest X-ray. Hypoxemia can occur at the start of an illness before X-ray alterations are visible. Whereas on arterial blood gas, the level of partial pressure of oxygen is standard measure of hypoxemic respiratory failure. PaO2 level below 70, at room air. Or P by F ratio, of less than 300 that is mild ARDS, or below 200 that is moderate or less than 100, in cases of severe ARDS, is considered AHRF. Once we confirm it, we need to look for underlying pathophysiology. There are three basic management protocols to follow while management of ARDS. First, airway management. Second, treating intrinsic cause and lastly, management of complication. Airway management includes oxygen therapy and use of non-invasive and mechanical ventilation. Treatment of cause based on the pathophysiology of AHRF. In cases of infections, either bacterial or viral, antibiotics and antivirals are used. In case of cardiopulmonary edema and left ventricular failure. Positive inspiratory pressure lowers left and right ventricular preload and afterload, as well as the amount of work required to breathe. Reducing the amount of labor required to breathe may allow a restricted cardiac output to be redistributed away from overused respiratory muscles. Expiratory pressure, also known as EPAP or PEEP, moves pulmonary edema from the alveoli to the interstitium, allowing more alveoli to participate in gas exchange. For management of mechanical ventilation in ARDS, please refer to our video series of ARDS. Various treatment approaches have been applied over the last few decades but the significant changes in mortality have not improved, since it is essential to detect and treat it as early as possible and save lives. Thank you. In the next video, we will learn about the type 2 respiratory failure, please subscribe and support us, thank you.